Record. All right, welcome to Chem 150. Uh, we are going to finish up thermochemistry here today, but before we do that, uh, I do want to remind you that you have an exam that is coming up. It's going to go live on Thursday. I am in the process of going through said exam right now. I've got a bunch of questions that I'm going to pare down and uh, I'm going to try my best to make sure that it works well for you all. Um, topics for said exam can be found on the support site. So behind me, you should see said support site. And if you go to the chapter objectives portion of said support site, um, and then you, so chapter objectives, then you scroll down to chapter six and you go to chapter seven. Those are the concepts that I'm going to hold you responsible for. Um, I'm not going to promise you that you're going to see a question for every single one of those bullet points, but every one of those bullet points is fair game, if that makes sense. So uh, for the people who are wanting a review guide, um, there are, like I said, uh, I've said previously, there are suggested problems from the end of the chapter here as part of the review site uh, for each chapter, but then um, also there are uh, these things that we're looking for you to be able to do. That's what we're going to be giving you uh, for the support for this coming up exam, giving you an indication of what to focus in on. Um, we have discussion section tomorrow evening at um, 7, I think it's 7, 7 or 8. I don't know, whatever's posted, I think it's seven. Uh, we also have one Thursday. And then after the uh, one is done on Thursday, uh, it'll be, because it'll probably take me about 30 minutes to get that uploaded. Um, then I'm going to, around two o'clock on Thursday, open the exam and it'll be open for 48 hours like we've discussed previously. So you should get an email about that. And the plan is that I'll give you two hours to do the exam, but it'll be set up like the quiz where once you start the exam, the timer starts and at the end of two hours, whatever you've done is what it is. If you have questions or concerns about that, please let me know. All right, so let's finish up this thermochemistry stuff. So last time uh, we did this problem where we walked through Hess's law uh, and we talked about how it's like a Tetris game and you just mix and match the pieces until everything cancels out and you're left with what you want. And the nice thing about Hess's Law is, is that it's another way for us to calculate the enthalpy of reaction. So that was the, that's one of the points of Hess's Law. Um, another way for us to calculate the enthalpy for a uh, chemical reaction is going to uh, involve this standard enthalpy of formation. So delta H F naught really flows right off the tongue there. The change in enthalpy of formation and then that naught is going to, that circle up at the top of the superscript, um, that's going to mean in the standard state. Okay, so this is the change in enthalpy that accompanies the formation of one mole of compound from its elements. That's a key thing right there. For this definition to work, we have to know, we have to have uh, the reactants in any kind of process be in their elemental form, and they need to be in their standard state. So we're gonna talk about what standard state means here in a minute. Um, the, like I said, the not symbol there, that red circle, um, corresponds um, and basically tells us, the uh, chemist, the reader, that the process is being done under standard conditions. Um, the reason that this is so important is because these uh, enthalpy values will change if you change the conditions of an experiment. So if you start changing the pressures, um, you start changing the temperature, those enthalpies will be different. So in order to relate a pro one process to another, uh, one compound to another, one element to another, we need to have everything in the exact same pressure and the exact same temperature. So we denote it with that not. Um, these standard states are going to be very 
very precisely defined references uh, that you're more than likely going to be able to find in a table uh, or in your book. So if you've been working on your homework and it asks you for uh, a value and you're like, well, where could I find that? More than likely, it's going to be a table in your book. Um, it might give it to you in the question. Just depends. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit what does a standard state truly mean? End of the day, we've got an element at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. That's not the same as STP. Standard temperature and pressure is not the same as standard state. So here in, in this next exam that we've got coming up with gases and thermodynamics, don't get those two confused. Keep them straight. STP, one atmosphere, zero degrees Celsius. Standard state, one atmosphere, 25 degrees. All right. So let's talk through the examples that we've got listed here of oxygen, sodium, and mercury. So oxygen at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius is in a gaseous form. And specifically, it's a diatomic, so it's going to be O2. So oxygen, as that's written, with that O2, with the phase being denoted as a gas, that is oxygen in its elemental form at standard state. Sodium. Sodium is a solid at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. That is sodium at its standard state. Now you might be thinking, okay, it's kind of ridiculous to put the gas and the solid um, because we just know those. Water is going to be that example again um, where things can kind of go a little bit crazy. Um, water is going, not going to be an element, but because its phase is going to be different, you can you can run into some uh, funny business later on with these kinds of problems again. Mercury is a liquid, it's quicksilver, um, at one atmosphere, 25 degrees Celsius. So every single one of these we would say is in their standard state, that phase. And a nice thing about this is like that change in internal energy, delta E, delta U, um, we don't really have a great way of measuring an absolute value of what the enthalpy is, but we can figure out what uh, the change in enthalpy is via things like a heat flow experiment. So we can measure the, if we set it upright, temperature change. Think about uh, calorimetry at constant pressure, kinds of stuff that we did, I think, last time. Q equals MC delta T. We're measuring the heat as it flows from one place to another. How does that help us with and what's that got to do with the enthalpies of formation? So let's take a look at the chemical equation we've got written out here. This one half N2 plus O2 goes to form NO2. So we've got half of a nitrogen, half of, or I'm sorry, half of a nitrogen, one whole oxygen equals nitrogen dioxide, mononitrogen dioxide. Off to the side, we've got this delta H of formation equals 34 kilojoules per mole. All right, both of our reactants are in their standard states because nitrogen is a gas at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. Oxygen's a gas at one atmosphere, 25 degrees Celsius. Cool. We have only one mole of our product being formed. We know we only have one mole of our product being formed because our stoichiometric coefficient is the invisible one. Now, some of you are kind of thinking, we've got this one half in front of the nitrogen, why don't we just balance this all out so that we have two nitrogen, or I'm sorry, one nitrogen, two oxygen, and two nitrogen dioxides, or mononitrogen dioxides. If we do that, we will not have one mole of product being formed. We specifically want, for our enthalpy of formation kinds of processes, we want only one mole of our product to be formed. And we want that product to be in its standard state. So in the case of nitrogen, mononitrogen dioxide, um, it's a gas at its standard state, and we have it listed out here as a gas. Awesome. 
This would be in a situation where you could possibly have hydrogen and oxygen combining to form water, wills water in the gas phase or liquid phase. Well, at 25 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, if we have those two uh, hydrogen and oxygen combining to form gaseous water, well, we didn't, we're not forming gaseous water at its standard state. So um, this enthalpy of formation that we're talking about isn't really going to apply well. Um, so looking at the example we do have, we have one mole of our product getting formed. So by the definition of enthalpy of formation, we have the reactants all in their elemental standard states. We have one mole of only one product being formed. Thus and therefore, this delta H uh, of formation at standard state, this delta H F naught, that value does correspond to the creation of our products. We can look at it and we can say, hey, this is going to be an endothermic process. We know it's an endothermic process because it's got a positive value here. If delta H was negative, we'd say it's an exothermic process. Now, for the last line here on this slide, another cool thing because of the way that we set up this example explicitly is that our enthalpy of formation is also going to equal the enthalpy of our reaction. So that would be the delta H RxN, the RxN being subscript. And the reason therefore, or the reason that, that that is the case is because of this equation at the very bottom. The delta H of reaction not is going to equal the sum of, that's what the, like the squiggle is, this uh, mathy symbol, oops there, this mathy symbol right here, the sum of, the moles of the change in enthalpy of our products minus the sum of all the moles times the change in enthalpy of our reactants. We're gonna do an example of this here in a second, try to help elucidate this. So this is a little bit of a um, situation that if we set up this equation and this uh, a scenario like we have here in the middle of the page properly, we get this nice relationship at the bottom our enthalpy of formation does not have to equal our enthalpy of reaction. It just sometimes equals that way. Okay, so let's talk through how to write out an enthalpy of formation uh, for different things here. So um, for each of the compounds we have, Write a balanced chemical equation corresponding to the standard enthalpy of formation of each compound. All right, so we're going to go to the board. So we know here for the first example for the HCl, HCl gas, um, we know that HCl is uh, made up of two other components, specifically hydrogen and chlorine. Now because we're trying to write an equation that um, corresponds to the standard enthalpy of formation, what we want to do is have these reactants be written out in their elemental forms at standard state. So hydrogen at one atmosphere of pressure and 25 degrees Celsius is really H2. Chlorine, which is, I pronounced very strangely, is Cl2. And if we do things as normal, and we say, well, this goes to form uh, hydrogen chloride, we're specifically not making hydrochloric acid here because we have not dissolved this HCl into water. And we know we haven't dissolved it in the water because we have the H and the Cl listed as a gas. So hydrogen chloride will be a gas, and we make hydrochloric acid by dissolving it into water. If we look at the equation that I've just written up, 2HCl, and we should say plus 2 chlorides, would go to form, or I'm sorry, not 2 chlorides, uh, chlorine, chlorine, diatomic, going to form 2HCl. 
balance the equation, everything looks normal. Trick is, by having this two out in front, we now do not have one mole of our product being formed. We have two moles of product being formed. And for that enthalpy of formation, we need only one mole of product being formed. What's the easy way to get rid of that? Uh, stoichiometric coefficient of a half? Yeah, let's change our stoichiometric coefficients. So if we make the stoichiometric coefficient of the HCl gas be 1, that means for our chlorine, that's going to have to be half. And for our hydrogen gas, it's going to have to be half. And I know that we're not probably uh, super comfortable with writing things out as half stoichiometric coefficients, but it is okay. Um, specifically here, it's okay because we know that the hydrogen and the chlorine are diatomics. And so what we can say is we're splitting the diatomics. Um, and I forgot the two behind the chlorine there. Um, we're specifically splitting this up to create one HCl. Now in the actual real physical world, it's very unlikely that this would be the way that you would actually form this. Um, like HCl, you wouldn't be forming it at half, uh, taking half of a hydrogen and half of a chlorine. You're going to be dealing with bulk components to form bulk hydrogen chloride. Um, but for thermodynamics, and specifically the enthalpy of formation, this is how we would write out that equation. So, a nice thing, because the enthalpy of formation of an element in its standard state is equal to zero, we would say, for this hydrogen, we know that the enthalpy of formation for hydrogen, because it's in its standard state, is equal to zero. Now, why do we know it's equal to zero? Because it's our definition. An element in its standard state is equal, has an enthalpy of formation equal to zero. We're using those elemental enthalpies of formations as kind of our reference bar. We're saying this is zero and everything else is going to be measured relative to this. For our chlorine, standard state, elemental form, we know that this is going to be zero. Now for HCl, this is not an element. It is in its standard state, but it's not an element. So its enthalpy of formation value is actually going to equal some number. So this would be something that you'd have to be given in a problem, or you'd have to be solving for in a problem, uh, or you'd have to look up in a book. What we could set up here then though is enthalpy of reaction not and we can use that equation NP times enthalpy of formation of our products oops let me get an F in there there we go minus the sum of enthalpy of react the number the huh minus the sum of the number of moles of our reactants times the enthalpy of formation of our reactants. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, by the way, if you're like, wait, where, what are we doing now with this problem? We are just taking this the next logical step. So the answer to the question that was written on the slide is this. But at the bottom of that last slide, we said enthalpy of formation can equal the enthalpy of reaction. Here's how. So this would have given the blue, or I'm sorry, the green here would have given us the enthalpy of formation. The enthalpy of this reaction we could set up as such. We would say for all of our products, in this case, it's going to be just the hydrogen chloride. 
we have one mole of that HCl and we're going to multiply it by whatever the numeric value of the enthalpy of formation of the hydrochloric acid is. Because it's our only product, we can close the entire product's parentheses now. So everything that was in this parentheses, or maybe I can make it a red bracket here. Everything that's in that red bracket has to deal with our products. Now it's time to do the reactants. So let's say minus, and I'm gonna, to try to write this out a little bit bigger, I'm gonna just write the reactants one line lower. So for our hydrogen, we had a half a mole of H2. We multiply this by the enthalpy formation of H2. plus, because this is what the sum of part of it means, so plus the one-half the mole of the Cl2 times the enthalpy of formation of our chlorine. So everything here in yellow corresponds to that change in enthalpy, uh, the sum of blah, blah, blah for our reactants. Cool thing. In the equation up above, we already rationalized right here. We already rationalized that this value is equal to zero. This value is equal to zero. So that means everything there in yellow is going to be equal to zero. Now, let's say that those don't equal zero, that they actually have a numeric value, cool. You can do the multiplication and the addition, and eventually subtraction, you could figure out what the numeric values are. But here, because of the definition, we're dealing with elements in their standard state, we know that the enthalpy of formation is gonna be equal to zero. Everything in yellow is gonna equal zero. Thus and therefore, our enthalpy of reaction is going to equal everything here in the teal, blue, whatever. Because it's literally the only thing that's still left with a number. And in this case, it's gonna be the enthalpy formation of our hydrochloric acid. So that's where that uh, information on the previous slide, oops, here at the very bottom comes into play and how your enthalpy of formation can be equal to your enthalpy of reaction. So we took that question an extra step. Everything past the uh, circle here was just little extra content, but the concept makes sense. The concept is applicable. Let's do the next uh, question here nice and quickly with each other. So we've got uh, acetic acid here. Acetic acid is going to be a liquid in its standard state. Oops. We know we want one mole of it. It's made up of carbon. It's made up of hydrogen. and it's made up of oxygen. Now here's the thing about carbon. Carbon has different allotropes that it forms. Um, and if you think about it for a second, you know, you may not know what an allotrope is, but you know that carbon shows up in multiple ways at one atmosphere of pressure. Um, so an allotrope is just a different form 
of the a different connectivity of the element um, so with carbon we have the graphite that's in your pencil lead um, we also have diamonds because diamonds are made of pure carbon so if we're going to have carbon written out here yeah it's going to be a solid that's supposed to be a bracket it's going to be a solid but specifically we need to pick the form of carbon that is the carbon exists in its standard state uh, its lowest elemental form and that's going to be graphite if you look in a book and you're looking at a table you'll see the enthalpy of formation of diamond you'll see the enthalpy of formation of graphite graphite will be zero diamond's going to be super close to zero but diamond is not the preferred form of carbon in fact if you have a diamond and you play time out far enough into the future the diamond will decompose not decompose rearrange into graphite and it's going to take you a super long time for that to happen but diamonds will turn into graphite so that you know, should make you feel really awesome about buying diamonds. They're going to be a diamond by the time, like, your kids, 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 on down. So don't really worry about it. Anyways, that's our little diatribe about making sure you use the correct form of an element when you look in a table. So we've got our equation. It isn't balanced, though. So it works the same way as we did the previous question, though. We ask ourselves, okay, how many uh, carbons do we really need in acetic acid? We need one. Great, we've got one written out. How many hydrogens? We need two. So we can put a two right there. How many oxygens? We need one. Fantastic. So, boom. We've now got only one mole of our product being formed and all of the reactants forming that product are in their standard states. Does that make any sense? Maybe a little? Play around with it a little bit, it might feel better. Yeah. Okay. So, the nice thing about the problem that we did, um, and I kind of took us an extra step on, is it's pretty much the last topic that we're going to cover for our thermodynamics chapter. Um, enthalpy of formation problems are algebra problems to a large degree. If you can think back to um, those problems that we did, uh, specifically the um, average atomic masses, um, where we said this isotope of an element has this much ratio um, that in, in existence and this uh, isotope has this much ratio in existence and we worked through things. Um, these problems are pretty much set up in a very similar kind of fashion. What you need to keep track of are just a fistful of things. One, you need to be identifying what is the question really asking you? Is it asking you for an enthalpy of formation or is it asking you for an enthalpy of reaction? If it's asking you for an enthalpy of formation, it's probably going to have to give you the information to figure out stuff here on the right-hand side of the equation. But specifically, you're going to have to figure out is it asking for an enthalpy of formation of products or reactants? Because if it's a product, your variable is going to land somewhere in here or the thing that you're solving for is going to be landing somewhere in here. If it's a reactant, it's going to land somewhere in here. Um, do you remember that um, just like with Hess's Law problems, if we end up having to reverse a reaction as part of one of these problems, uh, you're the value, the numeric value of your enthalpy is going to, or change in enthalpy is going to stay the same, but you're going to change the sign. Um, always look for your equations uh, to not be balanced, because if they aren't balanced and you start plugging numbers in, um, specifically for those moles, you're going to end up with a wildly incorrect answer. So make sure that your equations are balanced, or balanced properly, and that when it comes excuse me, when it comes time to start solving for things, you use that 
um, stoichiometric coefficient as part of your math. And remember, enthalpy of formation at standard state for an element is going to be equal to zero. You're going to get a lot of problems where, um, or you're going to see a lot of problems where you're going to have an element given to you as part of the problem, and it's not going to explicitly tell you. Um, oops. It's not going to explicitly tell you the, what the enthalpy of formation of your element is. You're just expected to know that from henceforth. Okay, so let's do a practice problem, and then we're going to call it good, and we'll do more practice problems and discussion as well. So fairly standard uh, kind of problem. Calculate the enthalpy of reaction for the combustion of glucose. And so you're given an equation here. Um, and then you're given a bunch of information here at the bottom. Cool. So let's diagram this problem. All right. So first off, everything on the left-hand side of the equation is our reactants. Everything on the right-hand side is our products. Personally, I like to write out these problems in a uh, few steps because I find that it helps me orient my thoughts better. Um, yeah, it's me taking more time to do the problem, but I'm a big fan of getting the problem right, um, even if it takes me a little bit longer than to maybe get the problem right, and it saved me a minute. Um, but to each their own. So if we are going to do like what I'm hoping that you'll do, you're going to take that delta H of reaction not and for this particular problem we're going to say that it's going to be equal to um, the sum of and I'm going to put a bracket to open up my uh, everything that's going to be for my products my products are co2 and water but specifically I've got six moles of co2 and I'm going to multiply that by the enthalpy of formation of CO2. Now since I've got two different products, I'm going to use parentheses to help me denote and keep track of my math processes. The squiggle sigma is telling me that I need to add all of the moles times the enthalpy of products for all the different products I've got. So this is then where I'd have six, oops, I need to put a parentheses down. I've got six moles of water. I'm going to multiply that by the enthalpy of formation of water. That's my last product. I'm going to close my bracket. And before I go too far, I just want to point out that that six that's used in this part of the equation uh, corresponds to the six that you're seeing in the equation uh, these six moles of carbon dioxide that get formed and the and then separately the six moles of water that get formed so those were that's where those sixers are coming from now because I'm writing kind of big and I ran out of room I'm gonna put my reactants on another uh, line. So minus, I'm going to give it the same treatment. Open a bracket because I've got two different reactants. I'm going to say I've got one mole of my glucose, the C6H12O6, times the enthalpy of formation of C6H12O6 close parenthesis plus because that's what the sigma is telling me I need to add all of my reactants plus open parenthesis the six moles of O2 times the enthalpy formation of O2 and I kind of got a little smashed, and I apologize for that. That's my last reactant, so I'm going to close my bracket now. So 
So pointing out again, the one and the six are coming from the stoichiometric coefficients corresponding to the individual reactants, their individual reactants. So that's always the first thing that I do whenever I'm solving one of these enthalpy, enthalpy of formation problems, is I go ahead and I write out my equation like this. I substitute in the number of moles, I write out enthalpy of formation, not a value, but I just write out the enthalpy of formation of the thing that I need there. Um, and then I make sure I've got all my products written out and that I've got my math set up where I need the sum and then I've got the reactants and I do the same thing. So that's always step one for me anytime I solve these problems. Here comes step two. Step two is the easy one because, I, because of the way that I set up step one. Step two is plug and chug. Um, so I guess it's like two and three because the chug can be the chugging part and that can be the third part. So the plug, and I'm going to, because I've got a gap in the way that I wrote those, if you have enough space on your page where you can just write everything underneath, I totally strongly suggest that. I'm going to say I've got parentheses 6 mole CO2 times, and now I'm going to put in the actual numeric value for that enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide. So from the information that's given to me on the problem, I know that that is a negative 393 kilojoules per mole CO2. And then I'm going to plus 6 mole H2O times the enthalpy of formation of my water, which it's given to me, and I'm being told it is negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. And now I'm going to close my bracket because that's the thing that I'm supposed to do based off the way that I wrote up the equation. So now I'm just plugging in numbers for all of the uh, things that I have written out. I'll do the same, same thing here for the... Uh, reactants. So minus one mole of the enthalpy of formation of my uh, glucose. So C6H12O6 times a negative 1273.3 kilojoules per mole C6H12O6 plus 6 mole O2 times, well, it doesn't give me what the enthalpy of formation of oxygen is. So I have two choices. Choice one, I can go look it up in a book. If I don't have access to a book, What's the other thing that I can do? I can remember my definition for the enthalpy of formation of an element at its standard state. So the definition here tells me that that enthalpy of formation, right, mirror, is going to be equal to zero. So easy breezy lemon squeezy. This whole term right here is going to just be a big fat goose egg. And so now if I follow everything in the lighter blue, I've got all the math that I need in order to actually solve this problem. So in some very riveting YouTube content, type it inside calculator. And this is where your individual calculator is going to be. I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you a great way of telling you exactly how to type it into your calculator. Um, because it is calculator dependent on the format. I would tell you though, make sure you keep track of your positives and your negatives and your brackets. Um, I see a lot of problems where people will um, end up with an answer that's seemingly really randomly off, but the issue is that um, 
a negative sign wasn't included in the proper place or a bracket, um, like somebody didn't close a bracket or put something in the proper uh, brackets. So I would strongly encourage you to double check your work and make sure that you're typing things into your calculator properly. All right. So the way that I typed that into my calculator here, uh, I got out a numeric value equaling a negative uh, 2,799.5 kilojoules. I'm not 100% sure if that's right at all. I'm going to double check here. Yeah, I don't think I got it quite right because I think that I'm off by around 100. So did I type in, very reasonable that I typed in the, oh, I didn't include a 0.5, so that helps. Oops. 0.5. And then uh, and then times a negative two. Yeah. Okay. Great. Because I didn't include a point five. The answer that I should have gotten was a negative two thousand eight hundred two point five. Units would be kilojoules because our moles are canceling out as part of that enthalpy of formation process. So what are kinds of things that you can look for or be asked about in one of these problems? Because this one was telling, asking for the enthalpy of reaction. Well, what if we gave you the enthalpy of reaction, but we asked you to solve for one of the enthalpies of formation? That's totally doable, especially if you go up and you write out that equation the way that I'm highlighting here in green. Because if you write out what's happening uh, like I have here in green as the first thing you do for an enthalpy of formation, uh, or I'm sorry, an enthalpy of reaction problem, you can then, you can then go in and identify which of these individual components is going to truly be the thing that you're solving for. You're going to be given everything you need for all but one of these. And it's going to be your job to figure out which one of those things that you're looking for and then looking for um, the ways to fill in all the other information. So it might seem like it's complicated, but if you write it out, like I said, there in green, it becomes pretty straightforward. There's only going to be a, uh, a couple of different um, things that we can really ask you for. Either that enthalpy of reaction over here or one of your enthalpies of formation. So for this particular problem, there are only going to be four different things that I could truly ask you. If I ask you one of those four, I have to give you the other three pieces. And uh, folks, that is it for thermochemistry. We done with it. It over. Um, except for discussion. Discussion, we're totally doing thermochemistry. Um, so that means that we're going to start quantum on Friday. Um, be on the lookout for... Uh, information regarding that because we are going to pare back the quantum chapter uh, a decent amount and try to um, really focus in on like the bare essentials that you're going to need so that we have plenty of time uh, for stuff like um, writing out chemical um, structures and the like.
that comes at the uh, end of this course. If you have uh, questions, comments, or concerns, please let me know via email, uh, ACE. You can post them in the YouTube comments. Um, remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Um, please do whatever you like on that. It doesn't really matter. Yep, and uh, this has been Chemistry 150. Does anybody have any, anybody who's watching live have any questions about anything? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, okay, so after the green part. After the green part. Yeah, after that, I'm good. Like, I get how to do the math and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But setting up the green part makes mm -hmm. very little sense. I'm very confused. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, let's let's see here. Da, da, da. Okay, so this problem that we did um, as part of an enthalpy of formation. Let's talk through how to set up the green part for this. Okay. Does that sound fair? Cool. All right. I'm going to take the hard part. Enthalpy of reaction at standard state equals. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. The. So what's your next, what's your next thought? Uh, products. Products. Yeah. If nothing else, so like. Um, if starting with the green is too um, jumbly or you're not feeling confident with that, you can start, uh, pencil disappeared, you can start with the equation that's at the very top of the slide that is being shown right now. You can write that out as the very first thing to help you orient yourself before going to the green. So I'll just throw that out there as a po another possible strategy. But you're right. Let's do products. So what are our products? Carbon and oxygen. So for the... Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm going to change <laughs> the slide here on the thing too. Because if people are like, where'd that question come from? Well, it's coming from this, but we're modifying this one a little bit. Okay, so for, um, it actually might be even confusing to have that slide up. I'm going to go back to the very, this like slide we had originally, because it's got the um, enthalpy of form. There we go. It's got the uh, generic equation up there for us. So for the one that's on the uh, whiteboard slide thing, Majig, our acetic acid is our product. What are our reactants? That's the carbon and the oxygen. Yeah, the carbon, and the, hydrogen. the hydrogen, and our oxygen. Yep. So this is where this equation up here above comes into play. I strongly suggest starting out with an open bracket for all of your product stuff, just to help you keep track of stuff visually. What should I do next? Or what are, you, what are your next thoughts or questions? The next would be the sum of the moles. Yeah. Maybe put that in there somewhere. Yes. So that sum of the moles, what that's, so if we look at that equation, um, okay, so if we look at this equation here at the bottom, that sum is going to be not referring to every single mole for every single product added. It's going to be, let's look at every single chemical product individually and multiply it's enthalpy of formation by the stoichiometric coefficient that's in front of it. Go to the next product. 
multiply its enthalpy of formation times the stoichiometric coefficient for that chemical compound. So on, so on, so on, so on. But then we're going to take all of that math and all of those uh, products and sum them. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, a little bit. <laughs> okay. It'll make for this particular problem that we're working through right now, it'll make more sense um, when we do the reactant side, I think. Because the problem with this particular reaction that we've got going right now is it's only got the one product. So it's not going to uh, elucidate that for us very well. So how many moles of the acetic acid do we have? One. Okay. One mole. And I like to label out the um, one mole of the thing that we had. So that's why I'm putting that chemical compound in there. Sometimes with problems um, that you'll see in the book and otherwise they're going to drop labeling it as a mole and they might drop labeling it as acetic acid. I like to just write it out to help keep track of things. This is going to be multiplied by the enthalpy of formation of acetic acid. Will that always be given to us? That number? Okay. So maybe, maybe not. The question was, will the number always be given to us? This is going to be a situation where, um, just like that last problem, um, oops, not that direction, this direction, all the stuff that's got the red underneath of it, any single one of those can be the thing that we're asking you for. Okay. You're, and whichever one you get asked for, the other three are going to be given to you, or you're going to be given enough information to determine what the other three are. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in this particular case, um, we don't, because we don't, this is just setting up what the equation would look like. This might be given to us right here. It might not be. It would really depend on what the question's asking for. But everything that we've got written out so far is going to be the finality of all of our products. So we can close our bracket and we can put that subtraction sign in. So for that equation that's above my head, we've done the moles times the products and all of the summing that's necessary. So now we're at the minus. And so we just wrote the minus in. Now it's time to go to the sum of blah, blah, blah for our reactants. So let's open up another bracket. What should be, if I'm going to do the carbon, how should I write that up? One mole carbon times the change in the HF naught thingy. Mm -hmm. What is that? What do you call that? Yep. So it's one mole of carbon times the change in enthalpy. H is our enthalpy of formation. That's what the F is at standard state. That's what the naught is. Delta H F naught works just fine. But strictly speaking, it's our change in enthalpy of formation at standard state. Specifically for the carbon, we're going to need to know what the value of that enthalpy, that change in enthalpy of formation at standard state is for carbon. So that would be something we could look up in a book or it's given to us. Okay. You have a question? No, no, maybe yes, no, maybe no, yes. Okay, so that's going to be for our carbon. What do we do with the rest of our reactants? Add. Add them. Do the same thing, but then add all the little nah. sections of it together. 
That's right. Now we're going to do the same thing for every single other one of our reactants. So our next reactant was our hydrogen. So how many moles of hydrogen do we have? Two. Two moles of hydrogen, that's right. And strictly speaking here, I should be putting in the phases of every one of these elements because um, the phase for more complex problems, like again, if you're doing something like liquid water and gaseous water, it could come into play, right? Um, that's just like the big one that just keeps coming to my mind for general chemistry one. There's other kinds of phase changes that for more other chemistries that you might use um, or might see more readily before Gen Chem one is mostly water. Um, I'm omitting writing them right now, but strictly speaking, I should be writing those in. So I've got the two moles of hydrogen and what am I gonna do with that? Multiply by the change in enthalpy of formation of hydrogen. That's right. Ch multiply that by the change in enthalpy of formation at standard state for our hydrogen. Yeah. Close that parenthesis. What should I do next? Oxygen. Oxygen. And I'm going to set it up the exact same way. So I'm going to add... I go up to my balanced equation, got one mole of oxygen times delta HFO2. Oops, I forgot my knot. Close that parentheses, and now I'm done with all of my reactants. And that's the whole. That's the whole shebang. Yep, that'd be it. And the key here is, um, or a key, it's not the key. A key is those sums, because that's what that summation sign in that equation that's above my head is really telling us to do. So it's saying take every single mole times its enthalpy of formation, or change in enthalpy of formation, and then add it with the moles times the enthalpy, change in enthalpy of formation for the next thing, like we have written out here on the screen. So, Hannah, to your question, what information would be given to us, what wouldn't? Um, stop, go away thing, okay. This, 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 this are going to be typically the kinds of things that you're going to be asked to solve for. Now, specifically, this stuff that's kind of in the green now, um, you already know what the numbers are for those. So ask me asking you for the enthalpy of formation of oxygen, elemental oxygen in its standard state, it's just zero, isn't it's it? It's just zero, yeah. So, like, I could ask you that, and maybe some of you would get thrown into a tizzy trying to figure that out and trying to look up stuff in a book and yada, yada, yada. That's a kind of question that, like, um, you should answer in five seconds. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, oh, yeah, this looks really hard, but it ain't because it's zero. So the answer to this question would really be the whatever the – products answer is basically absolutely absolutely so the enthalpy of reaction here is going to be equal to like ultra specifically the stuff in the blue are going to be equal to one another <laughs> what about the hydrogen one the hydrogen one because it has two moles oh back here yeah okay or no back well before yeah. Okay, right here? Yeah, on the reactants part. Okay. Why would that one be zero? Because what's the enthalpy of formation of hydrogen when it's at its standard state? Zero. Zero, yeah. So two times zero is? Zero. Zero, or 45 in Texas. I so that was just at like one mole, though. Is it? 
No, this is the thing in green. That's the value that's equal to zero. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's this enthalpy right here. That's what's equal to zero. Okay. Yeah, so you could have like 4,000 moles of hydrogen. Great, still zero. I can't ever imagine you having 4,000 moles of hydrogen for a chemical process that's like gonna end up with one mole of product being formed. I'm sure it's out there, don't at me, I'm not really interested. Um, now somebody's, okay, no one's ever gonna really watch this video this long, but that one person might in a million years and then like, well actually, like yes, 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 very good, thank you. Please have a seat, by the way, I'm dead. Today's caffeine of choice is brought to you by coffee. Does that help answer those questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Anything else you'd like to talk about? Because apparently we're I Canadian. Thursday? Do we meet? Oh, sorry. No, no, you're good. Do we meet on Thursday or is it just for, do we just do the test? Um, so we are going to have a discussion section um, at 11 on Thursday. So if you have questions, I'll have answers. Um, okay. If you come up with questions and you won't be able to be there for the um, live, but you want to watch them at, like your questions get answered after the fact, just shoot those questions into me. Um, excuse me, either via email or on the forum page in ACE or I guess YouTube comment, just emails, honestly easier. Um, just shoot those to me and then I'll try to get those answered. Um, because it's up to you when you start the exam. So like, if you want to, like if the exam goes live at two on Thursday, but you won't be able to watch the discussion video until three, watch the discussion video, then start the exam late night, Thursday or Friday or whatever. So we'll have until when to take the test Saturday at two, you said? Yeah. Around Saturday at two. So I'm going to give okay. you a full 48 hours from the start time. Okay. Yeah, and then um, it will be set as long as I remember to set it right. And I'm going to double check. Um, so I'm trying to make sure that your all's lives are as easy as possible. Um, it's going to be set that, let's say you forget to hit submit, um, it will auto-submit for you. So okay. but that's the plan. I wouldn't count on it, but... 99% sure that's going to happen. Okay. Yeah. Um, because nobody is really going to watch this video, I would remind you all, um, take a look at uh, bomb calorimetry because we mentioned in the videos that um, that was something I was going to ask you all to read over for yourselves and to try that out for yourself. Um, <clears throat> so there's more than likely going to be about a question, uh, regarding calculating the heat capacity of a bomb calorimeter. It, it walks you through verbatim, verbatim, step by step, uh, in your book. But for everybody who's watched the video out here at the hour and six mark or whatever, um, yeah, there's going to be more than likely a uh, bomb calorimetry uh, heat capacity of a bomb calorimeter problem. Okay. Yeah, but I've only got like, <laughs> I only have like 37 questions on your exam right now. So need to bump that up to a solid 50. That was a joke. That was a joke. I'm not putting 50 questions on an exam. It's going to be a 20 question exam. Everybody will be fine. Or 25. It's going to be 25. It's going to be a 25 question exam. Everybody, let's, let's all relax. It's going to be fine. Probably. I had the 50 minute thing, or I had the 50 question thing really uh, freaking out people on the uh, live stream. That was really good. For nobody, I apologize. That's all I got. Um, you're more than welcome to bug out. You're more than welcome to ask questions. Totally up to you. Well, thank you for the yeah. assistance. With that. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry. I think I cut you off. Me? Yeah. 
Oh, no, I wasn't going to say anything, but I'm about to leave, too. Okay. I hope you all have a good one, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.